Our key takeaways is just the bonding among startups. Uh, sharing the pains amongst different founders really makes you not feel like a loner. And the fact that you can relate this information to an investor and they can actually tell us, okay, what you need to improve, what the metric that you need to do, like it's, uh, it's, uh, has no price to it. And uh, the fact of being called over there to represent a group of uh, entrepreneurs, like for me, speaks volume because everything started as an idea. A, five, five, a group of five friends got together and they started today, we're speaking here in, in Joburg and representing what entrepreneurs can do. So for me, it speaks volume and I enjoyed the opportunity. You gotta keep on pushing. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, to be an entrepreneur requires a lot of resilience. And uh, if you have those elements and you're humble enough to uh, expose yourself in finding co-founders that can help you throughout the journey, that's really the essential. The success of Tupuka, I say it like it really came from the core five uh, co-founders that I have because in different right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode. This is your host, David Kim. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. By way of introduction, uh, would you like to tell us what you do and who you are? Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Semvezi. I'm 30 years old, about to turn 31. My background is uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, if you ask me before uh, 2015 if I would ever thought about getting into entrepreneurship, I would say no. But uh, on my last year of uh, engineering, I figured out that uh, engineering wasn't for me. So I decided to embark on this new journey to entrepreneurship. So that's where everything changed. Uh, I'm from Angola. Uh, I have uh, eight siblings and uh, we are uh, six uh, guys and two girls. So this is a little bit of my, yeah. yes, uh, yes. Very, we have very, a very big family. <laughs> And my grandmother has 10 kids, so it's, uh, I think wow. it's a trend here. Right. Yeah, in Korea, I, I'm from Korea. A long time ago, we had a, that kind of large family. It was common, but nowadays, uh, I mean, single kid is a very common for the family. Yeah, for myself, I want at least five, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, like I was saying, uh, big family, uh, grew up with a lot of expectations. Uh, when I grew up, my dad always wanted to have uh, each kid with uh, a specific profession. My task was to be an engineer. Uh, then I turned out to be an entrepreneur and a businessman, which is not a, uh, something that is really proud of. In the beginning, it was really difficult for him because of uh, uh, when I told him about the project, uh, it was for the first time in a country. No one pretty much believed on it. So uh, I had to break a lot of social norms in order to just uh, get the first people, the closest people to believe in a project, which was the Puka, which actually came from um, uh, while I was in school in San Francisco at Halt International Business School. I was exposed to many different business models. And uh, on the last six months, I was really worried because I couldn't find something to take back home. Uh, but thank, thank God to one of the professors that gave us uh, opportunity to work in any project. Uh, during that time, there was a boom in 2015 of like food delivery apps. It was a E24 Grubhub in San Francisco. Postmate has just uh, had just recently started. So I kept on questioning myself, why wouldn't this model work for Luanda that had like almost the same uh, amount of population in San Francisco, huge traffic, the economy was booming. So I decided to, okay, let's try it on food delivery. So during that class, we actually learned the ABC of setting up a business from figuring out what's the problem, what's the solution, market size, revenue model, into a point that the professor asked me, uh, asked us to build a financial model. And uh, once I showed her, she was like, is all this assumption true? I said, yes, we don't have this thing in Angola. It's the first time. The population is pretty young. The average age is uh, below 16 years old. And uh, we have an oil boom. Uh, she looked at me she said like, okay, if I was you, I'll definitely follow through with this project. That's whenever everything clicked. So the next six months during my master's, I couldn't even focus on other classes. I was just paying attention on any feedback or any lessons that they would teach that would relate for me to implement on a business that would pay, I would pay attention. So the classroom was filled with people from different backgrounds. Like just in our classroom, we had uh, 30 different nationalities, people coming from uh, engineering, marketing, sales. So it was a pretty much a, a, a good playground so I could get feedback from different uh, people regarding the business model. So Tupuka was built based upon feedback. 
Um, and uh, it was leveraged a lot on the, all the solutions that we found online. The logo was done online through a crowdfunding, uh, crowd, crowdsourcing uh, platform, where I found some market here from Australia. I gave her the task, she designed it. Our developer, we found it online as well. So everything was pretty much on Google. I didn't know nothing about programming. For me to communicate to our developers, every time he asked something technical, I had to Google the word so I at least know what he was talking about. So it was actually like a cool project that actually started growing. And then uh, just the fact of believing you're doing something for the first time in your country, which uh, not a lot of people have this opportunity, was really exciting. And I remember the first time that we saw the prototype, like the, the dummy version of the app. It wasn't functional, but we were so excited because like we could see something that we actually thought about happening. So that's a little bit of introduction of how everything came about uh, for Tukuka. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. I mean, you studied, uh, uh, you sourced every uh, things from the internet and work with the freelancer, right? Yes. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, please walk me through so how your Tupuka business works and how you make money. So the, the business model, it's uh, simple. It's based upon convenience. Uh, back in before 2016, for people to order food in Angola, they had to call. And this was causing a lot of problems to uh, restaurant owners because you, they would get a lot of fake calls and there wasn't no accountability. So uh, we saw an opportunity over there that, okay, if we provide a platform that was transparent, that uh, saved time for whoever was ordering, knew exactly what he wanted instead of saying, staying like minutes or on the phone trying to guess what he wanted, that would be a value proposition for the customers and for the vendors. On the other side, we saw like there was a, a high level of uh, youth unemployment especially for, for motorcycle drivers that uh, couldn't have access to decent jobs because of low skills. But one thing that they knew, they knew how to ride a motorcycle. So we decided to create a platform that would connect the three sites, users that want convenience, merchants that want to sell more, and individuals that want to work as uh, uh, drivers in order to pay off for whatever needs that they have. So we did a three-way uh, solution that was beneficial for all. So how do we make money? So there's three different ways of uh, monetizing Tupuka. First, we'd go to the merchants, which they're our first client. So every time I get a sale, we get a commission and our commission tends to vary between uh, five to 20%, depending on a category. And on a customer that wanted the convenience of not moving from his house to the merchant to pick up the goods, he would pay us a delivery fee. So that's the second revenue model. So we have commission and delivery fee. So later on, we started, uh, um, Thinking once we had enough uh, customer base on our platform, we started leveraging on uh, advertising. So uh, once the platform got populated, we started selling like uh, featured uh, suggestions. We started doing a lot of uh, uh, social media campaigns for the merchants in order to give them like more visibility. So these are the three uh, main business models uh, for Tupuka: commission, deliveries, uh, delivery fees, and uh, advertising. Got it. So sounds like a well-designed value chain of your business model. So do you have a competitor in Angola or other part of Africa? If so, the yeah, yeah, what are, we, yeah, I mean, that's the first question. Second question is what are so special about your business as compared to the, your competitor? So even before we started, we already had competitors. Our first competitor were the restaurants itself mm -hmm. because of uh, a lot of them were trying to figure out ways to increase sales. Some of them had motorcycles, they're receiving calls, even though they're losing. Uh, restaurant were our first competitors because of uh, uh, once we start uh, knocking doors and pitching to them, it's like, hey, we have a platform that's going to give you way more money without you even lifting a finger so you can focus on your business model. Often they would say, like, I already have my, comp my call center. I have my drivers. It's like, what would I need you for? So that's, that was just already the first uh, competitor that we fought with, that we, that we encounter in the market before even entering because that's what, that was the way that things were being done at the time. Uh, at the same time, there was a company that was doing the same thing that we we're doing by using phone calls, which we thought it was uh, uh, not viable because you couldn't scale. You need so many people. Uh, so throughout the time, as we started validating and uh, proving that smartphones and tablets can be the solution to solve this problem, many people start copying us. So we created a trend. So today, if a company wants to come into a market, they don't have to do much market study. They just say like, I want to be just like Tupuka. They made it, they did it. I'm going to copy exactly everything that they're doing. So we now have a, about a, a really competitive market space. 
Uh, we have uh, three main players uh, in our market. But what sets us apart is that the first love that the customers had for us, because we introduced this thing for the first time, and we kept on adding different solutions as we went along. We didn't just stop with the uh, uh, food delivery. We did surveys. We asked what users really wanted and on the platform. And the conclusion was like they wanted more service. So we started adding pharmacies, supermarkets, and many other things that the customers would uh, request. So we just kept on filling the platform based upon customer feedback. This is really one of our competitive advantage because we're always willing to listen because even since from the moment that the company was found, was found on feedbacks. So that's one thing that we keep in touch. Another thing is uh, uh, we are local empowered company. Uh, you see familiar faces. When somebody walks into an office, uh, they see themselves as working there because the guy who's uh, actually attending them, he looks like him. It doesn't differentiate the skin color is the same, they talk the same way. So it's really a, a, a young company doing things for Angola, innovating, showing that it's possible to have a world standard uh, uh, company with the world standard uh, platform operating in Angola, showing that we can actually break a lot of barriers. So this is one of the things that uh, uh, sets us apart, a willingness to uh, uh, innovate and our connection with our customer base. Got it. So uh, uh, how did you find the employee or co-founder in the beginning? Was it easy or so, did they ask you the if you had an investor or money to pay them? Oh, man. Uh, how I found co-founder, it's uh, uh, the way we started. It looks like a movie scene. Uh, my first, my first co-founder was my classmate mm -hmm. in, uh, in Angola before I went to the United States for a scholarship. Uh, we grew up together. Uh, we met when I was 15. He was, uh, 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 16. We played volleyball together. We always had a really strong connection. We always said to each other, like, uh, whenever we get a chance, we're going to open something together and we're going to empower so many young people. So I went to college. He stayed here. We always kept on in touch. And so I came across this, uh, uh, this project, I called him, he's like, Hey, I'm working on this thing. And I think this is it. Like, this is something that can make a difference. So while he was here, he was doing like market research over there. I was uh, fine tuning the platforms and getting the business model really in, in tune. So, uh, I really had my first co-founder like 15 years ago without even knowing, uh, and we locked in on this thing. My other co-founder was my uh, classmate from the uh, master's program. So I was doing a master in social entrepreneurship. He was doing master's in finance and it happened to be in Angolan. So once we came along on like uh, uh, the financial projection part, I wanted somebody that was specialized on this topic. So I came to, I came to him and I asked him like, hey, I have this project. It's like it's for Angola, you're Angolan as well. Can you help me just analyze this Excel and see if it makes sense? So he took a couple of days, he came back, he's like, it's just pretty solid. It's like 10% of error, but as an engineering, I'm like, okay, factor of safety is usually 30%, so I'm, we should be okay. So that's where I met our second co-founder who ended up being like uh, our first uh, CFO. And from that point, we started working on creating like crowdfunding campaigns through Indiegogo. Uh, we did everything at the point where we ran out of uh, money because it initially was self-funded, the company. We were selling everything. I sold watch, I sold a car that I had in the United States. Uh, just to support the business uh, for the initial phase. And uh, there were uh, many other people that were sympathizing with the project, but they never actually came along because whenever it came time to come back to Angola, that's whenever we knew like, okay, this thing is actually serious. So we came back to Angola in 2016, uh, in 2015, I'm sorry, around September. So the goal was to find job while we were supporting with our salaries, the project by financing it. Uh, on my case, I couldn't find a job. Like I wanted to find a job in um, oil industry, but they're not hiring. I had a master's degree, I had a engineering degree, and they're still not hiring uh, uh, for some reason. So I decided to just focus on the uh, on the on the on the venture. And then uh, throughout this uh, pitching to different people, just finding people uh, that wanna uh, work with me, I came across my CTO, who's uh, who's not from Angola. He was actually at the party and I saw him. He's a really tall uh, white guy. Uh -huh. And I came across him. He's like, hey, you speak English? Yes. He said, yes. Look, I have this project. Like, you, you, do you like technology? He's like, yes, I have my background in computer science. I'm like, man, God, you, you're actually talking to me right now. So I showed him like the, the application. He was like, hey, let's get in touch. So usually uh, as an entrepreneur, you're always giving up give business cards. And often people don't call you back. They give you so many promises. And this guy kept on calling me. Is like kept on pushing. I'm like, okay, this guy's really serious. Initially, he wanted to be a consultant. I didn't have enough money to pay him. So I told him, he's like, listen, 
I know your price is like, uh, at the time he was asking for $500 for a consulting fee. I said, I don't have that money. The money that I have, we want to reinvest it on the, on the, on the development. So let's do the following. On a monthly basis, I'll be paying you $50 with the increment of $50, meaning first month, 50, second month, 100. Throughout this point, if you believe that a project can actually work, forget about it, I'll give you some shares. So one month and a half into it, he called me, he's like, hey, I want to be part of the, the business. So over there, you're already like four co-founders. Lastly, my uh, last co-founder, we found him, we found him uh, he actually found us in 2016, around February. I got a random call uh, from a guy with a, a really American accent, an accent because he lived in the United States for 17 years, even though he's Angolan. He called me, he's like, hey, are you Ericsson? Yes, I've been following you for the last six months. I think you guys are doing something really unique. I want to be part of the team. I was like, okay. For me, it's like free labor. I'm like, okay, join the team. So I had to convince the other three guys that we had a, a fifth member coming in. And he came in uh, as an intern because the guys wouldn't like were too reluctant because he was the marketing guy, didn't speak properly Portuguese. So there was many frictions. But uh, over time, he managed to convince the team. So the core co-founding group of five people were set. So from that point, it was like, okay, let's actually uh, try to see, uh, create a blueprint on how we're going to launch it. Uh, and the hardest moment when uh, we realized all the codes that we were doing initially was all wrong. So we had to redo everything from scratch again. So all the crowdfunding, the selling of the car, everything was went has, has gone to waste because the code wasn't good because we invested everything on those codes. So from 2016 to uh, January to 2016, October, we were working against the clock. Because the new company had told us they will need at least six months to nine months in order to refix everything. So we had to figure out everything that we needed before those nine months ran out. So that's how we found our co-founders and our first people that joined the company. Yeah, you know the why I ask this question, right? Most of startup, I mean, they have a huge challenge and difficulty in fundraising. I mean, initial fundraising and the finding co-founder and employee. Yeah, because everybody's suspicious about something not visible in the beginning, right? But some, it sounds like yes. your your beginning and finding out the found co-founder employee sounds like a yeah, part of the movie. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, true, true. Because of uh, there's so many things that happen in between mm -hmm. uh, that we like six months into the the launch date, we didn't know how the driver would we would receive the the orders because uh, GPS system wasn't working properly. So we had a puzzle that we need to, we had to find like the connecting points. So until we figured out, okay, let's just give our uh, drivers uh, smartphones. Uh, it was a time in a country where finding cheap smartphones was really hard. So uh, we had to start like uh, asking people to send us a smartphone from abroad and uh, finding the software that will connect our system to dispatching. So it took us a lot of time and, and the, a lot of solution we actually found it not when whenever we were like concentrating doing research it was mostly out of a conversation i remember how we found our dispatching system we were going to the uh to a meeting and uh we we're asking ourselves it's like okay how can we have an equipment that it can work on any type of device and uh, our bag should be uh not fixed to the motorcycles so we saw a group of kids going to school so i saw the backpack i'm like why don't we just get big backpacks because a uh, backpack, you can use it in a car, in a motorcycle. And if the motorcycle breaks, you can still use the bag. So we started doing research. We found a couple of suppliers in Lebanon. So we ordered the bags and we figured out that the, the whole thing. And then the next thing was like, okay, uh, our first initial drivers, we had initially 16 drivers. They didn't have smartphones. And uh, for them, smartphones was any phone that had colored uh, uh, monitors or screens. So uh our initial driver they didn't know what google map was they couldn't navigate uh using instructions so for a period of uh three months we had to create like a lot of points around the city we were giving them orders so they had to discover like doing scavenger hunt pretty much in order to teach them because there was no infrastructure for that nature so we had to build everything from uh, ground up and then uh, uh, lastly, the challenge was before even finding investors over there is just us putting our personal funds. So uh, for myself, I, I was living at my, uh, my dad's house, living in couch. Uh, I'd come just recently come from a failed relationship. 
So everything was going backwards, like, and I was just fixed on this project. So uh, one thing that I say is really important is like, if I didn't have, uh, if I wasn't fortunate enough to have parents that would support me throughout that period that was unemployed and focusing on something that almost the world didn't believe, probably wouldn't be having this conversation because that's uh, one of the things that leads to a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs not surviving the, the initial phase because you don't have no income. And you're just working on like uh, hoping that sooner or later you're going to find something that can break and uh, generate some uh, some income. So uh, the last challenge was actually to convince the partners to join the application. So we have everything set up. We finally figured out how to deliver goods. We had uh, some customers that had already pre-signed up. We started knocking up the doors of different uh, merchants that we got from TripAdvisor because there wasn't no list of uh, potential merchants. So we got a list from TripAdvisor, we started calling them, we started going over there. Out of 400, only two of them accepted. So we had all these platforms. We, at the time, already had like 30 people working for us without generating income. So we were selling stuff in order to support salaries, hoping that whenever we launch, we're going to launch with like 100 orders, which it didn't happen. When, it, when the, first, the first day, we only did one order, and it was an order that my co-founder actually did. So... It was really scary because you have 16 drivers, you're only doing one order a day. In two weeks, we got into five orders a day and uh, we would take turns for drivers. Driver one would go today, that next driver will go tomorrow. So at least they can see some action. So it was really brutal at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, it, it is quite common. I mean, uh, starting the business from the scratch is uh, initial traction. Getting in initial traction is a huge challenge. Yeah, so I'm quite familiar mm -hmm. with that story. So let's switch the gear a little bit here. Let's talk about the fundraising. Uh, your mm -hmm. first, uh, you told me that you raised the money from Indigo campaign, right? After that, yes, uh, Indigo campaign, your first fundraising with the outside investor. How many outside investors did you pitch your deal? And how did it go? I lost count. <laughs> I lost count. count. <laughs> uh, so in the beginning, so how do we end up in Indiegogo? Yeah. Because uh, uh, we had to make a choice between selecting Indiegogo versus Kickstarter. Mm. So we read the instructions. Indiegogo said, if you set up a goal to raise on a crowdfunding campaign, $20,000, and you only raise like 1000 you keep that 1000 Kickstarter said, you only get paid once you reach your target. So that's the reason that we went to Indiegogo. Because it's like even if we raise like 1000 which actually happened to be the amount of money that we raised, because only one friend that deposited it out of like pityness because it's like she, 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 she saw that we're not doing very well on fundraising and she just helped us out. Um, yeah, that's an interesting story. Well, yeah. Yeah. So uh, another thing that we did, I don't know if you follow basketball. I was in San Francisco. I was so desperate to get funding. I had like uh, a couple of thousand dollars left. Uh, Golden State was playing against Cleveland for game six. So I decided to buy game seven tickets with the hope of like, if uh, a Golden State would lose, then they will go to game seven, then I would resell the tickets at a high price because they had never gone to the finals for 40 years. And I was like, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in San Francisco watching the game, hoping that the home team loses so they can go to game seven so I can cash out. It didn't happen. So luckily I always pay attention to small clauses. It said like, okay, if you bought the ticket for game seven, they will reimburse you in cases if the game doesn't happen. So uh, we tried everything on the book, like every fundraising uh, method we tried. In San Francisco, we uh, tried to participate to uh, uh, the Shark Tank. We actually made it up into uh, uh, the latest round of qualification. But once they realized that the solution wasn't for America, they uh, automatically disqualified us because they focused more on like uh, North American uh, uh, solutions or companies. So. From that point, we decided to shift our mindset. So while in the States, we we're actually participating at pitching con uh, contest, not to get funding because we knew it was extremely difficult because we didn't have any traction. It was just to get feedback. We'd go there on purpose just to hear what investor would say about our business model. How can we refine it? How can we improve our pitch deck? All these things. So it became like fun for us because we knew like, okay, this is, we're going to use America to get as much as know-how so we can bring it back. So once we got back here, like uh, usually, you know, a couple of people that have uh, uh, that are wealthy. So I started knocking on the door, asking for meetings. And every time I went for a meeting, they were like, OK, this thing is not going to work. They're going to steal your motorcycles. People don't have smartphones. People, Internet doesn't work here. It's like it was a bunch of no's 
constantly. But we are really used to no's coming from the States. Uh, and we actually believe that this thing was actually going to take off. It was just a matter of a person seeing that at the right perspective. So it got to a point where we couldn't close any external investors. So every single night I came back home, I would talk to my dad. I'm like, Dad, seriously, uh, we're doing something for the first time in Angola. Like, your son is going to do something that is amazing, that is going to empower so many people. I need your help. Every single night I was pitching to that guy just to give us some funding <laughs> in order to support ourselves. And, and my mother would help me. He's like, okay, I'm going to talk to your dad. And like, it was a lot of like just persistence until he gave us $30,000. That's what we used in order to figure out like uh, paying for the developers outside, uh, local marketing, things that was required, uh, getting the bags in order to, to start. So that thing that they say, like you start from family, friends, and fools, we actually went through all those steps uh, in order to have the, the, the company running. Um, uh, one thing that I had with my dad, we, we always build a culture of, uh, of rewarding. Every time you do something, you achieve something, he always make, he made it sure that it was a reward. Most of the time, I would say no to the reward. I'll say yes to the money. So it was like, okay, if you graduate from master's, I'll give you a car. I'll say like, okay, don't give me a car. Give me the money for the car so I can invest it. So that's how we actually were supporting the, the staff of 32 people with the uh, cash that I, I got from trading off something that I had. So it came to a point where once we launched, we were feeling like, okay, we have a little bit of traction, but the amount of cash that we're burning, in within three months, we're gonna run out, we're gonna go bankrupt. So the solution was to expand the business because when we started, we were only doing from eight to uh, 4 p.m. because we didn't know how to operate during nighttime. So it was a battle internally, even amongst the, the co-founder is like, uh, we need to expand the business and cover the entire city. They were like, okay, we're not ready yet. I'm like, don't worry about it. You guys focus on this town. I'm going to take a couple of drivers that have like uh, uh, some skill sets that are painters, that are like uh, uh, carpenters. Let's find a small, cheap office and let's paint it and let's create a base in downtown so that way we can expand the business. So during the morning, I would take a group of uh, seven drivers, go to them downtown, fix the office. And whenever we, they would call us, hey, the, the orders are going up, they would hop on a motorcycle, they go and work. So we're actually using everybody in order to, 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 to capitalize. Our first uh, uh, outside investor actually came from a, an Indian guy who happened to be a restaurant owner. So I would go in the morning to work with a guy to set up the office. During the afternoon, I would call partners around downtown in order to convince them to join the, part, the, the platform. So I called this guy. The guy said, like, okay, if you can get here in 10 minutes, we'll talk. I hopped on a motorcycle. I went over there. I met a guy. Like, I was sweaty. The guy was, you know how Indian are, man. They have a gold uh, gold ring, a gold yes. bracelet. I'm like, oh, my God. This guy has money. And we finally found an investor. <laughs> so I'm there, like, pitching to him. He's like, okay, you can increase your sales and stuff like that. So he said, I'm traveling on Monday. If you can set up everything by today and tomorrow, we're going to start. Okay, I was actually like with the computer setting up, taking a picture with my iPhone, and we managed to set it off. So a couple of days later, that guy called me. He's like, hey, I like your business model. I want to meet with you again. So he invites me to go to his house. I go there. Barcelona and Real Madrid was playing. I'm there pitching to him. He was, he was watching the game. So he, like, you just feel like you're pitching to somebody that is not paying attention. Internally, a bunch of emotions going through your head. It's like, man, am I saying the correct things? Is this guy really interested? And on my day, on my head, I'm just, just just keep on talking, just keep on talking. Then after I finished talking, he's like, okay, I really like it. Okay, let's let's meet again. So I went back to my co-founder. He's like, man, I don't know if I think we missed this one because that guy was watching a game while I was talking. So he called me again. This time, once he called me again, it was a Nigerian guy over there. So he's now Indian and a Nigerian guy. So it's like, uh, Andy told me about your project. I really like it. And I want to come in as well. And I'm like, oh my God, man, these guys, now I have two foreigners wanting to invest in the company. It's like over there, we didn't even know valuations. We didn't know how to evaluate the company. We just, we just wanted money in order to keep on funding the business. So we went back, we started doing research, value valuation based upon different methods and stuff. Uh, and uh, we came up closing a 15% deal uh, for, uh, let's say, around $150,000 uh, for that day. 
we closed that and they were, they were the, the, the initial investors. So, and that's where we started actually growing exponentially because now we had cash to uh, spend on marketing. And like, it was the first time us having cash that we burned the first uh, $30,000 within like the next 30 days. And that's when we were like, okay, okay, we need to slow down a bit and learn a little bit more about like, okay, actually how you monitor your cash flows, uh, keeping, uh, keeping in mind like what's your burn rate versus how many people you're hiring. And uh, from that point, we started, we started getting better counseling regarding how to manage the business. We changed our, our business model before the drivers were, uh, uh, they weren't contractors, they were actually like employees. We changed it to an Uber model. So people started bringing their own motorcycles to work. So we started optimizing the business to scale because there also would have been really expensive because we found out that drivers with a fixed salary were not performing according to what they were getting. So that's whenever we start shifting the things. And we started learning how to communicate with investors because now you had investors on your board. Uh, you had to report. You had to keep, be, be a little bit more consistent and more formal. So that's when we start finding investors. And then uh, uh, we kept getting uh, uh, even better regarding fundraising. We participated on the uh, Seed Start, uh, which is an a, a initiative out of a Switzerland, Switzerland company that just focuses on, on, on emerging market startups. Uh, where we won the best startup in 2017 of Angola. We participated on the African summit, uh, where we went through a lot of boot camps on like improving the business model. We went to Switzerland, we pitched. Um, but one thing that kept on failing us is like, uh, since not a lot of people know about Angola, they tend to overlook it. Uh, we would go against uh, startups from Nigeria that had like a large customer base. But once you see our transaction levels, versus their transaction, even though they have a large market, ours were like growing exponentially. So this uh, drew attention of the Switzerland company. They ended up investing in Tupukat as well uh, through a, a accelerator program that we went through a six week uh, process of really refining the business and understanding the KPIs and making sure that we had the growth formula for Tupuka. So, and then uh, we went ahead on keep on raising more funds. Uh, and, uh, and that is something that we expect to keep on happening according to our growth strategy. Yeah, so far, how many rounds? I mean, uh, did you close the funding? So, uh, our latest rounds, we, we just closed uh, pre-series A. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial deal, uh, it's uh, around uh, $1.5 million for 25% of the company. Uh, so this is the, the round before we start expanding aggressively, uh, internationally. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we, uh, end up doing is like, since the company started to grow, we started to create different projects within the company. So one of the initiatives that uh, actually grew, it's now the biggest, uh, taxi, uh, solution in Angola. It's Televa because of, uh, throughout our, our, our. Our process, we discovered that logistics was the main problem that Angola and many African countries had. Uh, I would see taxi companies sitting over there like uh, for like 60 minutes or 60% of the time uh, because uh, the most of the requests, they only have it around peak times. And they didn't have a way to, to, uh, to, to turn their operation more e efficient because they didn't have anything to do in between those uh, downtime. So we decided to create a platform that will connect with our platform. While we don't have customers, they will be doing taxis. And whenever we have customers, they will be carrying parcels as well. So we bought a, a solution called Televa. Uh, and when we launched uh, last year, we closed with a, a Chinese investor that came in with a thousand electric cars that actually invested, bought majority of the company. We're still uh, uh, active uh, members of the board over there. And uh, now Angola has the largest uh, electric car uh, fleet running, operating through Uber model in Africa, just throughout our innovation process, because we, we, we not settle on just what we have. We always try and experiment different things on the platform. So we have uh, diversified our portfolio. We're doing a couple of experiments in different segments, uh, payment solutions, uh, with uh, uh, marketing, and we keep on adding other things on the, on the, on the portfolio. Because one of the things that we really believe is that we need to keep on adding value to our shareholders so for them to continue depositing the trust. Uh, so I think we have done that successfully by diversifying the portfolio from the first investors that just deposited like uh, 180,000 
if they were to sell their shares right now, they would have uh, exited with uh, more than like uh, uh, 10 multiples of what they uh, put in. So it's really interesting what we're doing. And uh, we appreciate the freedom that they give us in order to be creative and keep on adding different business models. I see. So a uh, business you just, uh, e-vehicle business you just described, uh, invested by Chinese guy, is it separate company or the, what is your relationship with your company? Yes, uh, it's not a separate company that Tupuka has shares. Okay. So uh, Tupuka owns a quarter of the company. And uh, mm -hmm. one thing we came across is uh, uh, we have uh, uh, synchronized the strategy of growth. Mm -hmm. Everywhere he goes, we go. Everywhere we go, he goes. Every time we need a support on logistics, he can fulfill it because we have a thousand cars. Uh, so it became easy for us to, to operate. One interesting thing that happened during this pandemic, especially the state of emergency that was declared uh, last year, all the supermarkets, they weren't thinking about deliveries and e-commerce. They yes. had to force to join our platform because they didn't yes. have uh, infrastructure. So we converted right. all those assets into like actually logistics uh, to supply uh, uh, the demand that the, that the supermarkets had. So yes. within a span of three months, we had all the supermarket, all the main supermarkets in a platform, even though they were rivals. Like before uh, uh, COVID, that we would never see like five of these supermarkets within the same platform. So the market just shifted, the people's behavior starts shifting. So we capitalized on that. So it was really perfect timing uh, regarding this thing. And we just want to keep on adding on top of that. So uh, yes. we really have an active mind. Like we don't limit ourselves. If you ask us, okay, where do you see yourself within five years? I'm like, depending on the assets that I have, I'll just keep on adding it because what we're doing today, we didn't, we didn't plan it five years ago. It's the opportunity that came around. We adapt, we capitalize. So every time you capitalize, your vision opens up and you start seeing, okay, there's market for this thing. In Kinshasa, there's a need for this. Okay, how can I go there now as a complete solution versus how I was thinking initially when I was just pitching, we want to be across Africa. Now we have the assets. How can we go about it? How can we do this smart partnership where we involve local uh, players? So there's always a win-win solution everywhere we go. I see. So, uh, I mean, COVID-19 uh, related economic crisis, global economic crisis is a huge, uh, I mean, uh, negative impact to uh, most of business in the world. But sounds like it turned out to be a great opportunity for you to leverage it, uh, to grow the business, oh, yes. reimagine re your business model. Yes, yes. Because uh, 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 COVID, like, I will say COVID saved our business because of a uh, one thing that uh, uh, people underestimate, uh, uh, today we're talking about even expanding to Puka and to Europe through local partnership. But uh, once I'm looking at the European market, everything is set. They have good postal service that works. They have a payment system that works. You can integrate it with your platform. You need minimum amount of people in order to, to, to run a business. Contrary to here in Angola, you have to build uh, a payment system you have to create a controlling payment system because uh, it's subject to a lot of frauds uh, because it's a growing economy and there's a lot of unemployment. So if you don't bulletproof your process, you can lose a lot of money throughout the, the process. So we went through all these learnings from like, okay, you need an extra team on just treasury, just controls every single transaction. Whenever that guy comes back to the office, every single bid that he collected from customers has to reflect according to his productions. You have uh, issues with uh, nowadays, like uh, people are getting really savvy about credit card cloning and other things like, okay, how do you protect your brand from all of this? So it's a lot of effort. You're fighting different battles just to maintain one thing rolling that on the more organized market, you wouldn't even have to worry about this thing because everything is already being built. So whenever COVID was, it came in, we just had closed the investment. We were just fixing our, pro our process. And COVID just skyrocketed our transactions uh, throughout the Puka. And we managed to learn so much more because it was a period of that everybody was scared. The drivers were scared. Our employees were scared. Myself, I was scared because you didn't know what the next uh, uh, state orders would be. Uh, we had to have like a, a, a declaration for you to move around the cities. Like some of our guys were being arrested because they're staying after hours, even though they're under the rule that uh, delivery guys can work even after hours. So it was a lot of a learning period that only made our team even stronger uh, because we now know like we can adapt against any type of situation. 
So COVID yeah. really helped to really boost our business. Yes. It brought a, a lot more awareness on the on the market that okay, we really need to start thinking online now because it's a lot cheaper, and you can optimize all your traditional marketing expenditure on to online, and you can even grow faster. So one thing that we're looking right now to do is like okay, the market has opened their eyes. So if we continue operating the way we operate, we won't have nothing special. So we need to create a system that is open to everybody. If you have your own contact center, you can use our service. If you don't have your contact service, or service you can use our service. If you have your own delivery, guys, you can still use our service. Just create a solution that everybody can fit in. So our main mission now has changed. Is like we want to be part of every transaction that happens on people's life. If it's through sending something, if it's through buying groceries, if it's through making a payment, if it's through communicating, like we want to be part. So all the solutions that we're developing, it's always based upon connection and then universal needs like uh, those are the core things that the human being always needs that our business is tied around to so this makes us relevant independent of the trend or the situation that the market is facing yeah i can imagine yeah so covid 19 uh, turned out to be a great opportunity for you to uh, i mean grow the business uh, reimagine the business model to the next level yeah what yes, ha yes. what has been the biggest failure running uh, to Polka so far? How did you deal with that situation, and what did you learn from that? Oh, the, the biggest failure, uh, I would say, I don't say failure because we're still here. Yes. Uh, failure, I think, only failure is only when you fail and you don't get up. That's whenever you fail. Okay. Oh, but challenges. We had so many challenges. Uh, imagine a group of five guys. Most of us we didn't have working experience. He just came out of college. Uh, in a space of uh, one year, we went to managing from five people to more than 150 people. So your management skills is tested. Yes. Uh, the chain of command is not that direct anymore. It's not like you walk out, you tell the guy directly. You have to pass the message across different channels in order to get to the last guy, in order to execute it correctly. How do you filter that? How do you manage different behavior, different aspirations? So this was really the main challenge because the team grew fast and uh, often we didn't grow as fast because we we're too passionate about the process. And then we kind of like forgot about the basics about management. Uh, and then it get to a point where it's like, OK, your cash flow is almost running out. You need to raise investment. You start focusing on like management. You're just focusing on money, 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 because money is going to save you. So all those moments, it kind of like takes away attention from the core things, from attention from your to your customers, to your employees, to see those small things that if you don't pay attention can be turning to something really negative uh, along the line. So these are were the things that we, if we had uh, better mentoring, if we had uh, a little bit more experience, we could have avoided a lot of things. Another thing is uh, today I respect more the opinion of the guys that are actually on the field. Because they're they're seeing the stuff on the first run and their input is more valuable than anything else. Like you can read it from the book, but the market teaches you completely different and you have to be willing to listen. So those were the challenges because initially we were fixed on one thing. Now we're more open. It's like, okay, what is the market needs? If our competition is doing something better than us, let's actually observe what they actually did that is clever that we can take the learning points and apply it to our business. So we have a more open uh, way of dealing with things. And another, uh, the final challenge was like, OK, whenever you have a backlash on a market, how you properly communicate it with uh, proper PR? We learn it from the best, from, from the worst uh, case. Uh, some of some time, our communication outside wasn't uh, the. For us, it looked right, but it wasn't the most correct. As we look back, we can understand, OK, we could have done better. And today, before we communicate, before we go out, we're more sensitive of how we how we position ourselves. So it's, it's it's just a maturity, like we're maturing as we go forward. But I would think failure, no, uh, because every single challenge that we had, we're managing to, to surpass it. Okay. Uh, I assume that the organization culture required the quality and mindset of employee at a startup is very different from that of a larger company. So uh, yes. Did you uh, you didn't have a problem with a new employee? Who, I mean, you hire really hired who, who used to work at a large company or other than startup. Then the but the, their I mean the, their way of working, attitude, mindset are very different from the rest of your employee, and then very much process driven and narrowly defined that responsibility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
So if you, uh, in case you tell, I mean, face that, that kind of a situation, how do you deal with the situation and how do you try to transform the employees? Oh, uh, this is a, it's a good question. Uh, whenever we started, most of our employees were, that was their first job. So we need to, we had to teach them from how the system works, what's our business model, that Uber exists, Uber works like this, we're similar to Uber Eats, we're similar to that company. So it was really a lot of a inception to the concept uh, where we didn't find a lot of trouble regarding like uh, organized culture because it was their first job. It was more about uh, critical thinking. Uh, it's okay, I've t uh, you, you learn this platform, how it works is like, there are going to be so many situations that throughout the training, you didn't see it, but you have to apply critical thinking in order to solve the problem. That was really one of the main challenges that we had because of, uh, for some reason, the market doesn't provide a lot of uh, human capital with that critical thinking regarding quick decisions. Uh, because uh, uh, running a company the way that we're running, things were happening like like every second there's something new happening. Like you had some, you had you need to have somebody that has that process. So that was the main challenge. Over the time was okay. Now that we are really moving on a fast pace, how can we incorporate somebody that has similar experience, which was really difficult? It's hard to find somebody that actually worked from an e-commerce platform and uh, to come and join us. Uh, now the funny thing is happening the, the opposite. You have competitors that are coming and grabbing our employees to take it to there because our guys are really well trained now. So we kind of like initiate the market. Now we became a pool of actually people coming to pull up talent. So we're at the point that we, we, uh, uh, we're we solid enough. We're making enough uh, uh, money to start hiring some professional coming from different more organizing structure. So the first shock that they have is just the, the pace that the, the, the things move on a startup versus the organized structure. And then the channels of communication. I've tried it a lot to incorporate an email-based communication but for some reason, WhatsApp works faster than emails. Uh, it's really difficult because of uh, uh, our average age amongst employees are under 25. And the way that they've been communicating, they communicate more on WhatsApp versus emails. Most of them, they don't even, they only had emails because of like setting up a Google account or, a, or an Apple account. But using it on a frequent basis was difficult. But whenever it comes to WhatsApp, you, they know how to communicate. So we ended up having to shift a little bit of our communication process because that's what resonates the most with the, with the target audience, in this case, our employees. So we had to adjust. So the new employees coming from an organizing structure, they struggle a bit with this thing because over there is a lot of email process like, and they find it a bit cha chaotic. But after they understand the culture and the pace of how we're moving, they tend to adjust. So for us, we're trying to find that middle ground of that professionalism that the big structure have, but we don't want to lose that creative and the, the, the pace of movement that the young guys and the startup have. So it's pretty much a balance. On certain topics, it's email solved. On others, like solve it through WhatsApp, solve it through whatever chat, but at the end of the day, solve the problem, make sure the customer is happy. So that's period. So that's our process of, a, of a adapting as we go forward. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, what do you have on on top of your mind for the next step? Any any or or any additional fundraising plan to scale the business? I have seen the yes, expansion so plan on uh, on the website. I mean your pitch. You have exam, expansion mm -hmm. plan to the DRC and Mozambique, right? Yes, yes. So this business model, uh, it's a it's it's a bit weird. Usually, uh, people want to expand across the country to be in every city, but the demographic conditions of a capital versus the next, the next, uh, the second uh, largest city on the same countries, most of the time is completely different. The expenditures, the habits, all those things. So in, in Angola, it doesn't change much. You have over 10 million people concentrated in a small area and you have a, a vast country that is almost like the size of Spain and France that uh, from one municipality to another, you have to travel almost 100 kilometers. So on those business models, you have to be really smart on how you expand. You cannot expand by creating a base on every single city. You're going to burn a lot of cash and then uh, you're going to lose control fast because we have done this in small scale here in Luanda. And we have come into a conclusion that we need to rethink our expansion model. 
So this is something in the process. We're looking towards franchise models like uh, joint ventures, any model that guarantees that the brand expands. And then we keep on bringing our principles of doing business and expanding it to the world. So we're considering uh, uh, Kinshasa, which is a big city. Uh, population density is there. Uh, it, the country itself is super promising, considering the amount of natural resources that they have. It's a little bit politically unstable, but with time, that thing will improve because they have a lot more to gain if they organize themselves versus the opposite. We're really looking on, on like satellite cities to position ourselves so we can keep on giving this experience to the rest of the world. So fundraising comes comes to uh, comes along with this because we already built a platform where we have number, we have tractions. And once we go to pitch it to a, an investor that wants to come in into that city, there's a lot of similar traits that it makes it easy for them to be convinced that that's the right investment to do. So we're really open, like we don't close our mind. It's like the thing that we want at the end of the day is that this initiative should grow as much as possible, touch as much as life possible and empower as much as people. So, and uh, at the end of the day, we don't always consider like, okay, we want to be the majority shareholder whenever it comes to a certain location. It's more about the mission and the social impact. If we feel like, okay, that partner has the correct element, we're willing to, to give in even some of our things in order to just to capitalize that, that has always been our principles and it's been working for us uh, since then. Okay. Any, any last words? I mean, you want to share with, uh, I mean, assuming that the potential investor, potential partner is listening to, to this podcast. Yes. So, uh, Africa market is really interesting, especially the SADC region. Uh, Angola has its border to, uh, Congo, Brazzaville, uh, DRC, Zambia, Namibia. That's already like, if you just look at that, that's uh, over 160 million people just around that area. And most of this solution, as basic as it seems, is not available in Angola and in most of the static region. Uh, so it's like a blue ocean on several uh, initiatives, especially through, uh, throughout e-commerce. Uh, the other day, we're looking towards like even a dating platform. There, there's no dating platforms in SADC region. It's just you have a, a foreign company coming in, establishing themselves without localizing the needs. So our approach to business is really from local towards outside. So uh, the idea is to keep on taking the stuff that we made here and we guarantee that it work based upon different African realities that we face, we manage to overcome and start replicating as fast as possible to other cities because of we're definitely going to find challenges, but most of the difficult things we already had uh, discovered. So uh, the message to uh, investors is stop overlooking the SADC region. There's some interesting that things that are happening. Africa is not just about Nigeria, Kenya, or South Africa. There's more, there's more underneath the ground. And that's, that's the Tupuke is the example of this thing. Who would have thought a platform uh, out of Angola transacting more than $5 million with uh, 10,000 active monthly users. That just shows the potential that this thing has and then it can even grow. So, and this thing we're doing it with uh, pennies compared to what the VCs are used to invest on uh, other uh, startups. So we like to put our hands dirty and make things happen and show that it's possible. So that's the message that I have with the uh, uh, investors that are listening to this. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the taking time to be on the show and the sharing the interesting and your inspiring st story of your Pupuka business, entrepreneur journey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. David. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, share with a friend, and drop me a review. Goodbye.